What's up everybody, welcome back to Polygon Academy. My name is Tim and uh, we're back with another tutorial for you guys. So the last video I put out on trim sheets, it was super popular. Uh, I know a lot of you guys got a lot of value out of that, which was awesome. I love seeing your guys' response and feedback. Uh, but there was a bunch of questions in the comments as to exactly how I created the trim textures themselves. Um, because that video was more of a broad overview of the thought process and workflow behind using um, trim sheets, more of like a, a why video. And uh, I know you guys want to see the nitty gritty details. So that's what this whole four part series is for. So part one, this video, uh, I'm going to be touching on exactly how I plan out my trim sheets and we're going to be creating a base mesh for use in ZBrush. Uh, this can give us nice clean results. Um, because like if you've seen any of my previous videos, you know that like I'm really stressed on planning things out and starting with a good foundation and that's exactly what we're going to do. In part two, we're going to be taking that base mesh into ZBrush, uh, sculpting it, adding all the fun details, you know, cracks and damage and stuff like that while keeping the mesh tileable. Uh, then in part three, we're going to be taking that high poly mesh into Substance Painter and baking it to a flat plane as well as using some smart materials to create uh, a texture really quickly and effectively. And then in part four, uh, it's going to be more of a broad overview of some UV tips and tricks that I use to quickly and efficiently uh, unwrap my models because a lot of you guys had questions about, oh, you know, curved surfaces, stuff like that. How do I get my um, UVs into flat, clean strips for use with a trim texture? So I'm going to be showing you all my little UV tips and tricks that will hopefully, you know, take a semi-complex model that looks kind of intimidating and you'll be able to UV that in like 5-10 minutes and hopefully cut your asset production time in half. I know it's been a while since I released some content, so I'm going to put out the entire four-part series all at once. Uh, so if you're subscribed to the channel, it'll show up in your feed. If it helps you out, be sure to hit the thumbs up button. And if you have any questions or need some clarification, you can always drop them below and I'll be happy to answer them. So that's enough out of me. Let's hop over to the computer and get started. All right, so here we are inside of 3D Studio Max, just a blank, empty scene. Uh, usually when I start my trim sheets, I think about what is the final texture resolution going to be? In this case, I'm going to be building a 2048 texture. Uh, and what is the texel density going to be? So when I build things to scale, it looks right. Uh, in this case, I want to be going with a texel density of 512 pixels per square meter. Uh, this is something games like uh, Uncharted and God of War usually go for on, especially console games. Um, I'll, texel density is its own t uh, subject. I'll probably make a tutorial on that. And, but basically, um, I know if I'm using a 2048 texture, it's going to be covering about 4 meters worth of geometry. So that's where I'm going to start with a 4 meter plane. And just make sure it's on the, the world origin. That's going to make things a lot easier. So just snap to 0, 0, 0. Uh, I usually don't add any segments to it. And I also usually rotate it about 90 degrees just so it's facing upwards. Um, because what I'm going to do is actually create a biped for scale reference. Um, so that is in, where is it? Here it is, biped. And I'm just going to create uh, about a, where is it? A height, uh, 1.82. I usually use my own height as a scale reference, um, just so when I'm building things, I know what can look correct in terms of the, the amount of level of detail that I'm adding to things. So I just add him down here. That's cool. Uh, and so when I'm first starting out, how I divide up my trim sheets is I know um, I'm probably going to need at least a one meter, uh, if, especially if it's something like a concrete or tiling wall texture. Uh, I'm going to at least need a one meter high section of trim because in a lot of games, cover tends to be exactly one meter high for design metrics. So what I'm going to do is convert this to edible poly. I'm going to divide it in half just by connecting these edges first off. Uh, so that's a two meter and a two meter piece right here. Um, so if I divide this in, in half again, uh, so there you go. I would have two one meter tall trims, which are going to become extremely useful. Um, next thing I'm going to do is what I usually do is I start dividing this up um, into half meter trims. And then this top one, I'll usually divide in half to have uh, some thinner strips. Uh, because I, these are the kind of the ratios that I find the most useful. Um, a lot of people, they might, they might just take some of these edges and start adjusting them to be slightly different like widths. And I don't find that really effective uh, because I know I can always map it to the, the geometry and adjust the actual squash and stretch the geometry a bit. And that's going to be a lot more useful because if all of my lines are evenly divided into, you know, half meter, quarter meter, it's going to be a lot more useful in terms of using this texture according to metrics that comes to creating assets that fit in the game. As well as if you standardize where all of your trims are, 
Uh, say this is going to be a concrete wall texture or a stone wall texture or something like that. Um, basically, if I want to quickly make a metal variation, if all of my trims are using the exact same dividing lines, uh, instead of having to take that asset and change the UVs, because if, say, you know, on your metal one, this one's actually like two small trims like that, and, you know, you have another one down here, it's, I'm, that means if I want to map the, the thin strips that I've mapped on the stone wall texture to the ones on the metal one, I'm going to have to actually go in, adjust the mess, and adjust the UVs instead of just keeping everything consistent. Uh, so if, say, on the stone and the metal one, it, all of the strips are in the exact same place, uh, I can just swap the materials, and that asset is going to quickly be another variation with a, just a drag and drop instead of having to go back into max, edit UVs, change things around. Um, so if you can standardize the way that your trim sheets are set up across a game production, it's going to be a lot better because say you have a window frame that's mapped to you know some peeling wood strips of a trim texture. Well, oh, we need a metal variation of that window frame instead of you know going in, making a completely different trim sheet, uh, and trying to remember where all your different trims were laid out. You can just take the exact same layout, this base like um, basically your your preset locations of all these trims, create a metal one, swap it. It's gonna be a lot easier. So now that I have my set established, uh, standardized trim widths that I think are gonna be pretty useful for creating a wide variety of assets, I'm gonna go ahead and break these apart um, into you know their own separate models that I'm gonna quickly shape out and block in my overall trims. I'll just time lapse that out, and uh, anytime there's an important piece of detail, I'll stop and you know give you guys some notes. So for any horizontal tiling trims, uh, where you just want it like a co continuous strip of detail, you actually don't need these end cap faces because when it tiles, this is all going to be seamless. Uh, on these ones, they're going to be individual like brick blocks. So that's why I actually kept all of the interior detail. If I uh, grab these elements and move them apart, you can see that this is I'm going to sculpt them into bricks. And uh, you might notice that I'm not actually not adding edge bevels at this point. Uh, because I know inside of ZBrush, when I go in and start chipping up the edges, it's actually going to bevel out that edge naturally and create these. So by keeping these seams really nice and tight in the beginning of my base mesh, uh, when I, once I start subtracting away from the mesh by carving it and sculpting it in ZBrush, uh, that'll add those edge highlights for me automatically. And I, know I don't have to go in and worry about adding support edges and like high poly modeling this at this point uh, for most of these basic shapes um, because I'll add all the detail inside of ZBrush later on. So for this trim piece here, you can see I kind of want these uh, extruded like knobbly details. And because this thing overhangs uh, the mesh, usually if you look at it in the, say the front view, this is exactly how your normal map is going to look. Um, so you can see what I did here is I took this bottom uh, edge along the underside of this overhang and just pulled it down a little bit. And that adds some extra added depth to your texture because if it's exactly flat with this top edge, if we look in the unshaded view, you actually don't, you won't really see it. You'll see like a thin little lip, lip of detail once you sculpt on it. Uh, but if I undo that, you can actually see now that it has some sense of depth. And actually probably what I'll do is I'll even take these little knobbly pieces, uh, add an FFD on the front of them. And give them a bit of uh, a little bit of squash and taper, just so when I look at it in the front view, you can see now, uh, even like right now, you'll see a lot more of the form, and it'll give this a, a better sense of 3D geometry, even on a flat trim sheet. 
Uh, so that's the little tip. Um, these overall edges along the tops and bottoms of the individual trims, uh, I know they're going to be sculpted and that's going to add a little bit of bevel too. But for anything that's overhanging or inset into things, uh, don't just do a flat inset. Actually take those faces and scale them in a bit to so show that really like there's a groove or an overhang there. So now that we've blocked out the overall uh, thickness and kind of general look of our trims, I'm keeping this super simple, uh, very square blocky shapes. But if you want to spend a lot more time, you can create some really cool complex flowing curves and stuff like that. That always looks really good. Uh, but for this example, I just want to really, really show you the, the basics. Um, so we're going to keep it something super simple. The next step, um, so I have three blocks here, a tiling horizontal uh, strip of stone that's going to be the, um, just you know, a very basic thing that you can add along, long flowing walls and stuff like that, great for modular pieces. Uh, some concrete tiles here, um, a more of like a curved uh, ornate kind of thing that you might see on like you know, um, the top of a wall piece or around a column or something like that. This one here is going to be more of like a, a band strip um, with you know, two little trims at the top and bottom and then some inlay detail. Uh, we're going to add all that in ZBrush. Uh, this one here is like an, an overhang with you know some knobbly detail. And then this one here is just going to be another thin basic strip of uh, chunky tiling stone. Uh, great for adding just little edge highlights around small details and stuff like that. Um, but before we move on, we're going to need to prep this mess for use in ZBrush. Uh, so what we're going to do is I'm just going to quickly go over the mesh and make sure everything is kind of like evenly quadded out. Uh, and that way when we subdivide the mesh, it's going to um, subdivide nice and cleanly and evenly and we're going to have an easier time sculpting this. Also on any edges that I want to be uh, like a hard edge, I'm going to go in and crease them. Um, so for example, if I isolate this mesh, uh, what I would, how I would prep this mesh is I would, I know I want these to remain hard crisp edges here, here and here. Uh, what I'm going to go in, in, in 3ds Max here and you see this edge properties, I'm just going to crank up the crease on this. Uh, maybe not quite all the way to one because I do want it to be a little bit soft. But uh, you can do a test and see how it's going to subdivide by just adding a quick turbo smooth modifier. Um, obviously the ends are all getting all messed up because there's no uh, edges all the way to the end. But what I'm going to do is uh, prep this whole mesh, just grab this and connect all these until it's everything's roughly, you know, kind of a square evenly subdivided polygon. Something like that. Uh, probably is fine. You don't have to be exact with this. Uh, I just like to have my meshes kind of evenly quadded so it subdivides nicely and then any edges that I want to remain hard creased. Uh, instead of going in and adding tight little support uh, edges because that's going to bunch up all your polygons in, in ZBrush along the edge of the mesh uh, and you're going to, when you start to sculpt damage on it, it's going to fold in on itself and not look good. So by just using the crease, you can actually uh, get some nice results. And what you can actually do is uh, what I usually do to test it, how it's going to subdivide is, so you can see when I added the first turbo smooth modifier to it, um, it just subdivides it with that crease and then I add another turbo smooth on top and that's pretty much going to be what happens when I uh, subdivide the mesh inside of ZBrush. And if I want this to be a little bit of more of a harder edge, I'm just going to select all these edges I've creased, something like that. And I'm going to just crank that all up to one. And actually, if you do uh, show end result, you can see by just cranking up the crease, it softens or hardens these edges. I still want them to have a little bit of softness to them. That way, when we render out our normal map, it's not going to be like this super sharp one pixel line of normal map information. It's going to actually be a nice soft bevel and it's going to read better uh, on our mesh. So I'm going to go through and prep each one of these objects. Uh, for use in ZBrush. Um, for all, these, all of these tiles, what I'm going to do is select all of the edges because I know all of the edges I want to remain nice and crisp uh, until I sculpt over them. So I just select every edge on the mesh and crease it. Uh, if I had done that on this curved piece, if I had creased all these individual loops, it would give it a really faceted look, but uh, that's why I only creased the, the edges I wanted to remain hard. Um, but for something like you know these stones and bricks, the quickest way to do it is just select all the edges, crease, Boom, uh, then I'm going to go through and actually chop these up into evenly sized polygons. Also, while I'm working on this and starting to prep this mesh for ZBrush, uh, I'm not too worried that the quads on this bottom trim, they don't have to be the exact same size as all the ones on the smaller trims. Trying to keep everything the exact same is going to drive you nuts. Uh, as long as everything is just kind of evenly sized out across the different meshes, each one of these is going to be its own sub tool inside of ZBrush anyways. Uh, and it's going to be subdivided individually. 
Um, so some of them might get two or three levels of subdivision, and then some of the ones with the larger polygons might get four or five and end up all being the same kind of overall density. It's totally fine. All right, so now that our mesh has been evenly divided up, um, yeah, the polygons are all different sizes and stuff like that. Some of them are a bit more rectangular. That's totally fine. I just want the meshes to evenly subdivide nicely in ZBrush when I actually go in and start sculpting, uh, as well as I've just quickly gone through and, and named each tree no trim A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, we're not here to learn the alphabet. Uh, let's move on. So I'm just gonna export these out, and then in the next video, we'll be bringing these into ZBrush and start sculpting. And when I export, I usually just use the ZBrush preset, export as an OBJ um, and name it the exact same thing as the mesh inside of Max. So now that they're all exported, uh, you'll also notice because they all started from the same plane and I just detached them, they all share the same pivot. It's directly in the center of the mesh and actually all at the origin of the world, zero, zero, zero. Uh, that means when I import them into ZBrush as sub-objects, they're all going to be aligned perfectly with each other exactly the way they are here in Max. I'm not going to have to move them around, and it's just going to all work out perfectly. All right, so we've got our trim sheet planned out, our base mesh created. We're ready to bring this into ZBrush and start sculpting, adding all the details, basically the fun part. Um, and so that'll be coming up in part two of this series. I'll leave a link in the description box so you don't have to go searching for it. Uh, and I'm super stoked to dive into ZBrush. This is really where the fun begins and uh, you get to really get your hands dirty and just start getting really creative um, now that we've got a really solid foundation to build off of. If you enjoyed the video and learned something, smash that thumbs up button. If you didn't, you absolutely hated it, hit the thumbs down. I don't take it personally. Uh, and if you have any last minute questions that you need clarification on something, drop them down in the comments below and I'll do my best to get back to you. Thank you guys for watching. See you in the next video.